thanks, David. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Todd Johnson. I'm the Director of Marketing for TransCanada's Western Pipeline Assets. I'm going to go to the end of the presentation. Yeah, David worked on that. I'll just keep going here and maybe we'll get an EV guy up here. Um, look, uh, TransCanada has been uh, um, just getting active in the Rockies. Um, we, have, uh, we have a significant footprint of assets all across North America, um, 35,000 miles of actual pipes. But uh, the Bison Pipeline was our first uh, project in the Rockies. And uh, I'm going to spend some time talking to you about Bison and uh, give you an update as to where we uh, where we plan to go with uh, Bison in the future. So I'm sure everyone is interested in uh, listening to the uh, an update on the recent incident on Bison. I thought before I got into the details of what happened at Bison, I'd just remind everybody about uh, what the Bison project is. Um, Bison is a new build pipeline. It's a little over 300 miles connecting the Powder River Basin supply uh, to markets at Ventura and Chicago using the northern border system. So this was a new build pipeline, 30-inch uh, pipe. We have uh, commitments from uh, four anchor shippers uh, for 407 million cubic feet a day, uh, Anadarko, Williams, uh, Minnesota Energy, and uh, Mid-America were our anchor shippers. Uh, I said the system was a 30-inch system, um, so at 400 cubic feet, uh, 400,000 cubic feet. Bison has a lot of expandability, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, what we plan to, plan to do with that. Uh, Bison came into service January of this year, and uh, flows for the first half of the year averaged around 365 million a day, or approximately 90% uh, of the capacity of the system. So we were certainly pleased uh, with, uh, with how the system came on. Um, unfortunately, on, uh, we had a failure on the system on July 20th uh, near, uh, near Gillette. Um, the, uh, and we've been working closely, obviously, with PIMSA since then uh, to, uh, to bring the pipeline back on stream. Uh, let me just give you a brief recap of, of the timeline. So the, the failure occurred, uh, occurred at milepost 16 on the system. Uh, gas control in Houston detected the pressure drop. They took immediate action and shut down uh, the system. Uh, there was a release of natural gas, but it did not ignite, and um, there were no reports of any third-party damage. Uh, Bison declared an event of force majeure uh, to its customers on the 21st. Um, at this point, the, uh, the cause of the failure is still being investigated, uh, but we, TransCanada, has identified that mechanical damage um, was the primary cause. Now the source of the mechanical damage and when it occurred, of course, is still under investigation. And we're working again, as I said, uh, closely with PIMSA to, uh, to ensure that everything's understood about, uh, about the, uh, the failure. The damaged pipe has been um, repaired and replaced. Um, we've submitted a restart plan to PIMSA, uh, which is being reviewed. Uh, part of that restart plan PIMSA required Bison to uh, do a number of investigative activities uh, which are ongoing, um, including uh, running an inspection tool. Um, the uh, uh, inspection plan has been approved, and so we will begin shipping uh, gas again tomorrow. Uh, for It'll take about six or seven days to run the tool, and so customers uh, have nominated gas to help push that tool through. Uh, Bison's going to flow at approximately 60% of its capacity uh, beginning Friday, and uh, and we'll go uh, through until the the tool has been uh, has been uh, removed at the at the Chris interconnect. So it's our expectation that the information uh, from the tool run is going to be the last bit of information that PIMSA will need uh, when they in order to evaluate the restart plan. So um, you know, returning the pipeline to safe operations is uh, is a first priority for TransCanada. 
and uh, we will certainly ensure that uh, PIMSA has everything that they need in order to be able to make that determination. So um, I'm going to maybe move on here without my slides, which is more difficult than you can imagine. Um, <laughs> So we're going we're to talk a little bit about uh, what are we going to do with the 30-inch uh, the system. And um, really, there are two opportunities for Bison going forward. Um, you know, Bison uh, ha provides an opportunity for Rocky Mountain producers to diversify away from the Cheyenne hub. And certainly over time, uh, Cheyenne has experienced uh, numerous price disconnects. Um, over the next number of years, there are uh, significant contracts that expire on the southbound routes out of the Powder River. And we believe that Bison will be in a, in a good opportunity to attract some of that supply as producers uh, try and diversify their market exposure. Uh, so we will certainly be working closely with existing uh, Powder River producers and uh, um, showing them the advantages of, uh, of tying into Bison and getting, uh, getting access to the Ventura and Chicago markets. Uh, many on the panel have also talked about um, the additional resource uh, potential that's coming out of the Niobrara. Bison also sits um, w within that footprint, and uh, we are uh, optimistic that there will be associated gas uh, available to the Bison system that would allow uh, Bison to, uh, to take advantage of that as well. The, uh, the last piece that I will, uh, will talk about is um, something that we like to call the Bison, expan uh, bison Extension. Bison right now goes from Dead Horse uh, up to Northern Border, but it is, uh, it is only 240 miles to extend that project down to Wamsutter and connecting in additional Rockies supply. Now certainly today it does not look like in the short term that the Rockies is going to need additional takeaway capacity, but the Bison extension has the advantage of it being a relatively short build, 240 miles, somewhere between 450 and $600 million of capital which would mean it would require a very low threshold to proceed and uh, connect in that extra, that new pipe. So to the extent that the Rockies does need extra takeaway capacity, this would be a more bite-sized project that would allow, uh, allow us to take that gas north to Ventura uh, to higher value markets. And if I could get to the last slide, there it is. If you've got, <laughs> if you've, if you've got questions, if you've got questions about the Bison Pipeline project, please contact any of those uh, that are on the, on the slides, um, or I'll certainly uh, be hanging around afterwards and be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Todd. I'm sorry about the slides. The slides will be in the final packet. Uh, you definitely proved that the slides are optional. It's the <laughs> You did a great job uh, without them, so thanks very much. Okay, next up is uh, Todd Kramer from Kern River. Thank you. I'm hoping your pr presentation works. I, I do too. You know, <laughs> given all the technical glitches and things that can happen, I'd like to say that was a very nice job, Todd, particularly if you didn't have, didn't have uh, slides to go over. But uh, good afternoon. I'd like to also thank everybody for um, sticking around on the last day to the afternoon for our, our panel session. Glad to have you here and listen. Um, I'm going to start out by talking about uh, an overall summary of who we are and who our corporate structure is and our parent company. Um, Mid-American Energy Holdings Company owns Kern River Gas Transmission, which is who we are, and we're in the western part of the United States. Our sister pipeline company, Northern Natural Gas, is located on the map there in the central part of the United States. They also own uh, the Pacificor Companies, which is an electric utility, Pacific Power in the states of Washington, Oregon, and California, as well as Rocky Mountain Power in Wyoming, Idaho, and Utah. And uh, Pacificor Energy that supplies the um, generation and electric trading for those two companies, as well as Mid-American Energy located in the state of Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota and Illinois, which is a gas and electric utility with about 750,000 customers apiece. Um, CE Electric UK, which is an electric distribution company in the UK. And um, Cal Energy, which owns generation assets in Yuma, Arizona, Saranac, New York, um, Imperial Valley, California. 
and then Home Services of America, which is a conglomerate of real estate companies. Um, first of all, I'd like to start out uh, covering three areas, customer satisfaction, a regulatory update, and then also an update on Kern River's expansion projects. Starting out with customer satisfaction, Kern River is pleased and grateful to our customers for our customer satisfaction scores this year. Kern River ranked first out of 43 interstate pipelines in the 2011 Mastio survey. We increased uh, scores in 22 of the 28 attributes that Mastio uh, measured in 2011. And also Kern River ranked second in the 2010 survey and first in the 2009 survey. So I would like to thank our customers for this strong response. I guess you could say with this response, we're pleased but not necessarily satisfied. We have some work to do. This is something we take very seriously. We have actions to expand our understanding of customers' businesses, uh, improve customer training of our systems and our services, expand relationships with management of our customer companies, as well as to uh, develop, execute, measure, and adjust customer-specific improvement plans. We do take your input very seriously, too. Um, moving on to regulatory. Um, FERC issued a, a final ruling in our 2004 rate case, I said 2004, on July 21st of 2011 this year. And what it does is it finalizes our period two rates on the Kern River system. As you can see, this is a list of our uh, current rate structure, period one rates, which is significantly lower, which aren't shown, significantly lower than what our rates were prior to the rate case. And then also it sets period two rates for when our period one contracts um, are extended by customers into period two. You can see with the rates here dropping, starting where they're at and dropping down even into the 20 cent or even the teen range, uh, you can see that, that this level, our rates continue to drop over the years and our rates are very competitive with other pipes leaving the Rockies. We believe that these rates combined with our strong reliability record really add or create a lot of value for our customers. Okay, onto the expansion projects. We're nearing completion of a major expansion project on our system, which we call our Apex Expansion Project. This project will expand our system by 266,000 decatherms a day with service to NV Energy on the north side of Las Vegas. We are closing our Wasatch Loop, which is a section of unlooped pipe uh, with 36 inch diameter, 28 miles of pipe over the Wasatch Mountain front into the Salt Lake Valley. We're adding 78,000 horsepower new compression at four locations and we're restaging, I believe, four other compressors. We received our FERC certificate in September of 2010 as well as our notices to proceed. We're on schedule with this uh, construction project to have it placed in service by November 1st of this year. The completion of this project will further strengthen our, our outstanding reliability record and um, we're excited to get it into service. As you can see by this map and the pipeline route, there's a profile down at the bottom and you can see that the map is very rough terrain. The project traverses uh, mountainous terrain um, that's received nearly, I think it's received over 700 inches of snow in some parts of, of these mountains here over the last winter, so it's very difficult to get in and do the construction. Anybody calculating, that's over 60 feet of snow, so it's quite a bit. Um, so it's been challenging. The left side of that map is the Salt Lake Valley with the low elevation down on the profile. And I'll go over some pictures here. Uh, this picture is just a, a picture of the right of way along a ridge. It's representative of the terrain of most of the construction. So you can see it's a remote area. Um, not unlike El Paso's project, uh, we had a big Chinook helicopter, heavy lift helicopter that was used to haul equipment and supplies up the mountains as well as trees out during clearing. Um, the trees during clearing of the right of way, some of the larger trees actually had to be removed and flown down the mountain. And here's a picture of the helicopter moving a couple of trees. This picture is of a joint of pipe being lifted up from the staging area for movement up the right of way. This is kind of a neat picture. It's 10 or 11 shots on one frame 
of the helicopter coming down and picking up a piece of pipe and flying away. It's, there really aren't 11 helicopters here. <laughs> kind of shows the flight path. And again, it's another uh, multiple exposure picture here, just showing the helicopter come in, drop its pipe on the right, well, not drop its pipe, but set its pipe on the right away, <laughs> and continue on back for a, another round. Another picture here just showing the remoteness and steepness of the terrain to the right away. Here's a picture of the pipe that's la uh, laying in the ditch and it leads down in the Salt Lake Valley. If you look in the distance, that's um, Salt Lake City or North Salt Lake anyway. I think there's a, a Chevron refinery even in the distance there. But This is kind of a neat picture. This gives an indication of the intricate pipe bending that's involved in the project. You can see the bends and following the curvature of the terrain there um, can be some difficult construction. Just another couple pictures showing the steepness and remoteness of the right of way. This picture appears to be a, a high altitude staging area for the pipe. Um, there's pipes set along the right of way. And then, you know, um, I thought I'd point out that, you know, I'm in marketing in the field, engineering, construction guys. You know, I think they really like the mar us marketing guys a lot because um, they told me that if I ever wanted to go out and visit the right of way, they said they had a, a special VIP transport booth that they'd let me ride in out there. Um, apparently, it's supposed to be pretty fancy. It's got seating for one. It's got a built-in restroom. <laughs> so I'm really excited to go out there and see the right of way myself sometime. Uh, another project we're working on is our mountain pass lateral project. It's a, a direct connect from our main line down in San Bernardino County, California to a rare earth minerals mine. It's a nine mile, eight inch diameter lateral with a capacity of just over 24,000 decatherms a day. And uh, the lateral will connect to the mine owned by Molly Corp Minerals. Uh, we filed for our FERC certificate in December of 2010 and this project will be in service uh, sometime next year. So um, we're excited about getting that project complete. Uh, future expansion pr uh, potential on Kern River. Kern River still has the desire and the ability to expand its system to California. Uh, to do that expansion, we will have to build approximately um, 76 miles of 36 inch pipeline to loop Las Vegas. There'll be a number of other factors involved. Obviously the supply demand, market demand for it is gonna come into play and uh, the infrastructure up and down uh, upstream, downstream um, for the expansion project and a, a three year lead time. But, but we are ready and we are willing to expand and we do have the ability to expand again. Please contact me if you have any interest uh, in a Kern River expansion or more capacity on our system. Thank you very much.